welcome everyone. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Click that notification bell so you never miss another video. Now let's get going on to these creepy haunted tales. Have you ever been out in the middle of a wheat field at night? They could be several square miles, so even though it grows about two feet tall in America, there's still nothing but wheat as far as the eye can see. You'd think that such an open space might leave you feeling free, but it doesn't. It just makes you feel very, very exposed. During college, I worked summers for a small agricultural pest control business in Oklahoma. My boss, Owen, only had one truck and two employees, Will and a local 20-something with a punk band and myself. We would start at sunrise and spend all day spraying hundreds of acres. Owen would drive the truck around slowly, tracking our progress with the GPS, while Will and I would apply the pesticide with hoses from the truck's tank. There are much better ways to apply pesticide, like a plane or a rig, but farmers are notoriously cheap, and Owen was cheaper. We were also in one of the worst droughts in the history of Oklahoma, and agriculturalists everywhere were tightening their belts, so I took what work I could get. One August evening, we were out spraying for an old friend of Owen's. It was a large wheat field, a few square miles at least, and the sun was disappearing below the horizon. In a few minutes, it would start getting harder to see, and Owen would have to turn on the truck's mounted floodlights. About how much more? Asked Will when Owen stopped the truck for a water break. We had been done a while ago if the tank wasn't giving us issues, replied Owen, checking the GPS. We probably got another hour or so. Sometimes you gotta spray after dark. So, we kept spraying. It was about 15 minutes later Owen hadn't even turned on the floodlights when Will started yelling over the roar of the tank to me. When he got my attention... He started pointing forward. What's wrong with the field? He yelled. I squinted. About 50 yards ahead, the field did indeed look different. But it was too difficult to tell exactly how in the dimming light. Will rapped on the truck's window. The truck stopped and Will shouted over the tank. After a moment, Owen turned on the floodlights and we all gasped. Fifty yards out, the field was devastated. Empty stalks were drawn everywhere. Not a single plant left standing. I'd only ever seen this sort of thing on the news or in books. Owen stopped the car and we all jogged ahead to inspect. Harvey didn't mention any empty patches in the field, said Owen when we arrived, kneeling down to inspect the ground. He probably doesn't know about it yet. Called us too late, too. See the stalk? It looks fresh, and it looks like insect activity. Owen pulled out his phone and tried dialing his friend, but nobody answered. Do we spray it? asked Will. Seems a waste of application. He hired us for the whole field, Owen shrugged. I groaned internally. I'd rather be on my way home, but I couldn't begrudge Owen. He was cheap, but he was a good man. I turned to get back to work, but my legs froze in place when my eyes caught the outline of a dark shape in the empty ground. What's that? I said. The others turned, and we all gathered around the dimly lit form. It was a dog, brown, medium-sized, and dead. I gave its leg a nudge, which flopped lifelessly, so rigor mortis hadn't set in. 
I couldn't tell the dog's breed, though for a moment I wondered if it was part pug, because its vacant eyes seemed to be bulging out of its head. Looks young, healthy, even, said Owen, and fresh. The flies haven't even set in yet. Wait, said Will. It's moving. The dog's cheek was gently wriggling. I almost thought the dead animal's face was still convulsing when a large brown grasshopper crawled slowly out of the dog's mouth. It was wet, and a few strands of some dark, unidentifiable liquid dangled from its long back legs. Huh? Was all I could say. But grasshoppers don't eat dead meat, said Will. Some will, said Owen, but only when they're real desperate, not when there's plenty of wheat to chow down on. Matter of fact, I'm guessing this guy and his friends are what did this to the crops. Then where are his friends? I asked. For a moment, we all stood in silence. A lot of times, especially in summer evenings as the sun sets, you can hear the chirping of grasshoppers or even the buzz of faraway cicadas. But as we stood in this field while the sun continued below the horizon, our ears were met only with a stony silence. The newly discovered grasshopper continued crawling its way along the ground. It was weird to see a grasshopper crawl instead of hop. It felt unnatural. I'll squish him, said Will. Leave him, said Owen. The spray will choke him soon enough. Let's get back to work. So, we returned to spraying. It became much easier once we reached the devastated crops, since all we could really do was spray the ground. We'd only been spraying for another ten minutes when... Much to my surprise of Will and me, Owen shut off the tank. The stream of chemicals from our hoses weakened and died, and Will and I looked at each other in surprise. What's up? we asked as Owen got off the truck. Owen didn't say anything. With a concerned look, he walked around to the front of the truck, looked to the horizon, and started staring. He was squinting westward to where the sun had finally disappeared, leaving only the remnants of the sunset. What's up? I asked. There's somebody out here with us, said Owen. We squinted into the dying light. I could barely make it out against the western horizon, but after a few moments I recognized the silhouette of a figure a good hundred yards away, ambling slowly towards us, then quickly, slowly, quickly. Owen was right. There was someone out in the field with us. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. Who would be out here alone? It wasn't Harvey, the field owner. He was a round man, and the figure in the distance seemed almost dangly, and it appeared to be struggling. It seemed to move its whole body just to take a single, laborious step. He's moving weird, said Owen as he squinted. It almost looks like, like he's having a hard time breathing. And Owen took off sprinting to help the figure. After several seconds, I looked at Will. He shrugged, I shrugged, and we both started off in a low jog after Owen who had managed to get a good 20 yards ahead of us. It was light enough to see that we were getting closer to the figure, but dark enough that we couldn't actually see what it looked like. Is that a cloud? asked Will, panting as we jogged. It took a second, but I saw what he was talking about. A dark floating mass had appeared out of nowhere, and it was heading straight for us. There was a dull buzz, and I only realized that it was a few moments before it engulfed us. It was a humongous swarm of locusts. The insects zoomed towards us, 
whistling past our faces noisily as the swarm surrounded us. The noise grew louder and more horrible, like a hundred lawnmowers all going at once. I could no longer make out Owen ahead of us, much less the figure. The insects became so dense they started flying into us, their bodies colliding against our faces and chests. I closed my eyes as we kept running, but it got so bad that, after a minute, Will and I were forced to stop. Did you see where Owen went? Will yelled over the roar of the swarm, and I yelled back that I had not. For about ten minutes, all we could do was stand there. I'd never seen so many insects all in one place before. The last bit of sunlight died, leaving us in the dark of night. Finally, the swarm seemed to thin out. We could start moving forward without the bugs hitting our faces. We jogged in the darkness for a bit, calling out Owen's name. I was right in the middle of a particularly loud and long, Owen, when without even realizing it, I face-planted into the dirt. I got the wind completely knocked out of me. For a moment, I could only lay there. Finally, my brain registered that I had tripped over something. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my cell phone. Why hadn't I thought of this before? And illuminated the light to see what I had tripped over. It was Owen. And he was stone dead. I gasped as I scrabbled away. Owen's body was sprayed out on its back, and it was covered in locusts. And how did I know Owen was dead? An entire mass of locusts were crawling around the inside of his open mouth, packed so densely that I couldn't even see his teeth or tongue. There was no way he was alive, and to seemingly confirm that thought, I watched as a particularly large locust crawled over his glassy, open eye and just I stayed there. I gasped at the spectacle in the light of my cell phone as Will ran up. His reaction was a bit more visceral. Lots more vomiting and swearing. I turned off the light of my steady, almost dead cell phone and my eyes eventually adjusted to the dark. The buzz of locusts continued as they whistled past our heads. We should call an ambulance, I offered. He's already dead, said Will. What's good an ambulance gonna do? It's what you're supposed to do in this situation, I insisted, not actually knowing what to do in this situation. Let's call it from the truck. We should get out of here before the grasshoppers get to us, too, said Will, swatting uselessly at the swarm. I don't think locusts can kill a man, I said. Not by themselves. Then what did kill Owen then, Charlie? said Will defiantly. Maybe Owen just had a heart attack. We can but I was interrupted by a sound only a few yards behind Will. We both turned, and because my eyes had adjusted to the darkness, I was able to see the outline of a hobbling figure shuffling its way towards us. Will and I turned and ran for our damned lives. Of course, this meant running through the swarm that was in the direction of the truck, and the truck was our best chance of escaping whatever had befallen Owen. We could barely see where we were going, but it was better than what was behind us. What was that thing? Will screamed as we ran. My lungs were starting to give out on me. I couldn't have answered if I wanted to. Still, I sprinted. I stole a glance backwards, though the swarm was too thick to see anything in the dying light. But it was still coming after us. I just knew it. It had gotten Owen, and it wouldn't stop until it got us too. After a few minutes, however, we had a stroke of luck. I cheered internally as fluorescent light slowly became visible through the swarm. 
It was the truck's floodlights guiding our way back. Onward we sprinted, locusts grazing our faces. We finally arrived at the truck. Fortunately, it was still running. Owen had only turned off the tank. We immediately scrambled in, me in my passenger's seat and Will in the driver's seat, and I was slowed down by the bottles of pesticide on the seat which I frantically threw to the floor. We slammed our doors shut, Will then threw the gear in the drive and we peeled the hell out of there. The headlights illuminated the hundreds of brown locusts that flew in front of us as we drove. The truck wasn't going fast enough to splatter them yet, so they bounced noisily against the windshield like large hail. Soon, a sizable collection of wings and legs started sticking to the glass. Will even turned on the windshield wipers, but try as we might, we couldn't see farther than three feet out of the windshield as we drove, so we shouldn't have been surprised when Will drove the truck into a drainage ditch. I had put on my seatbelt. Will hadn't. His head slammed against the steering wheel. For a few moments he seemed stunned, but he came to after a few seconds. Will slammed his foot on the gas. We could hear the tires spinning uselessly. We were at such an incline that I doubted the back tires were even touching the ground. Will swore and slammed his fist against the steering wheel in frustration came from the metallic sound of something striking one of the truck's rear doors. Our eyes widened as we looked at each other and then turned to look back. <laughs> came two more blows. The door shook violently. It's outside, whispered Will. It's trying to get in. Could it be? We've driven away. Was the thing that fast? But what else could it be? I considered the direction we had come from, the direction that the car had been pointing, and my stomach sank as I realized that Will had not driven us away from the thing. He had driven us right towards it. Suddenly, Will screamed, yanking his hands from the steering wheel. It was now crawling with locusts. I looked down, the locusts were crawling up from the floor. they gotten in through the underside of the truck. They even started squeezing out of the AC vents. Within a few seconds, it seemed the cabin would be flooded with them. We began frantically brushing them off of us as they flew around, and I saw the panic rising in Will's eyes. They can't kill you, I insisted as I swatted the insects away. They killed Owen! They're gonna eat us! shouted Will, and he reached for the door handle. That thing's out there! I screamed. I'm running for it! He screamed back as he opened the door. He leaped out and disappeared out of view, leaving the car door open and me exposed to whatever was out there. Before I could say anything, the swarm outside flooded into the cab. I closed my eyes as they brushed against my face. I could feel them crawling on my arms and legs. The door was still open, and all I could think about was if that thing outside was going to crawl in and kill me. <laughs> there was a heavy slam against the hood of the truck. My eyes instinctively jolted open. It was Will. His body was blocking the headlight, so I couldn't see much of him except for his panicked face, which was crawling with locusts. No. No. There was something more. There was something around his throat. No. They were thin, almost skeletal hands. Something was holding him against the hood. His face grew rottier as he clawed at the emaciated fingers of his assaultant. I was frozen in place and could only watch as his bulging eyes rolled back into his head. Finally, Will's body relaxed and slumped over, his eyes unfocused. 
If I had to guess, I'd say his windpipe and spine had both been crushed. The locust seemed to take no notice of this and continued to crawl around his face. I didn't even have a chance to hop into the driver's seat when the thing appeared through the open door. And it looked right at me. If it was once human, I couldn't tell. Its flesh looked like that one of a naked mummy that they sometimes put out in the desert sands. The skin stretched and hardened. Where there should have been eyes were only sockets, from which a few locusts would randomly emerge. Where there should have been a nose was only a cavity. And where I could see various retina and the occasional legs sticking out. But this was not the worst. The thing's rib cage was exposed, and I could see into it. And it appeared to be completely filled with humongous locusts. Even over the dim of the swarm, I could hear the full buzzing of the crowded insects as they withered around their bony cage. Occasionally, a smaller locust would manage to squeeze its way between two ribs. It would crawl around the exposed ribs for a few moments before leaping off and joining the swarm. The thing cocked its head. How it sensed me without eyes, I don't know. The thing moaned, and its jaw began to creak open. I could hear the straining and crackling of leathery tissues revealing a mouth with uneven, rotting yellow teeth. Suddenly, the thing vomited. A thick stream of brown liquid shot out and sprayed me, getting my shirt in my bare arm. Before, the locusts had been swarming in a natural, random manner. But at the sound of the vomiting, the insects immediately focused their attention on the liquid. I was now covered in the insects. Their buzzing was defining, and the stench of the liquid was almost overpowering. It smelled like liquid smoke and bile. Dozens of locusts flew out of the thing's mouth and joined the other ones now crawling all over me. I could feel the locust's tiny mandibles against the skin of my arm scraping away the substance. It didn't hurt, but damned if it didn't freak me out to all hell. I screamed. As I sat there, Owen's body flashed through my mind. I realized something. The locusts hadn't been crawling around his mouth. They had been crawling around out of it. With a sudden sickness, I understood that the grasshoppers hadn't killed Owen directly. They hadn't had poison or venom or even a way of really biting him. No. The thing that grabbed Owen and forced dozens of locusts from its mouth down into Owen's throat. Owen had slowly choked to death as the crammed insects crawled and fluttered into his esophagus, trapped in the narrow space by their own sheer numbers. I almost gave up hope right there. The thing was now slowly clawing its way through the cab towards me, its dead-looking hand reaching blindly out towards me. I tried groping behind me to open the door. I didn't dare take my eyes off of the thing. Lest it jumped on me when I wasn't looking, I was almost completely covered in locusts too, all except for my right leg. Wait. Why weren't the locusts swarming me there? For the slightest moment, I glanced downwards. One of the pesticide bottles was puddled onto the floor of the truck. I had knocked it open when I had thrown it to the ground. When diluted with water, five ounces to about fifty gallons, most insects wouldn't notice the pesticide. But in its concentrated form, they knew full well that it was something to avoid. The thing crawled closer towards me still. I had to take a gamble. While it clearly knew I was there, the way it felt around and the fact that it had no eyes told me that it might not actually be able to see me. I might be safe to make a sudden movement. I reached down, grabbing the bottle of pesticide and flung its contents at the thing. Some flew out. The cap wasn't open all the way. But the thing screeched horribly and reeled back. But it was only for a moment. The thing didn't flee. 
I opened the bottle more and began flinging as much pesticide onto it as I could. The thing continued screeching. I wanted to grab another bottle, but the now frizzy locusts were too numerous and were slightly weighing me down. In desperation, I began drizzling the pesticide onto myself. Not normally a good idea. The locusts began to disperse, grabbed another bottle, opened it completely, and began throwing as much poison onto the thing as I could. Finally, the thing began to retreat out of the door. I was able to open the truck door and stumble out. I ran like I had never run before. The din of the swarms buzzing began to fade behind me, ahead of me only miles and miles of lonely wheat fields. Once or twice, I thought I heard shuffling footsteps behind me, but I only ever saw stalks of wheat swaying slowly in the night breeze. I eventually made it to the dirt road. My phone couldn't get a signal, so I walked the dirt road for two hours until I finally hit a paved road, where three hours later, I was able to flag down a trucker who let me use his phone to call a ride home before I contacted the police. The police never got back to me. They didn't even call me in for questioning. Owens and Will's bodies were never found, and their families never got any closure either. At least, none that I heard of. I got acute poisoning from the pesticide, which resulted in severe patches of dead skin that have since scarred over. I later learned that Harvey and his family, the owners of the field, were reportedly missing. After their disappearance, the land became the property of the government, and from what I've been able to find is now considerably mostly useless. They just can't get anything to grow there. I longed for the nights where my mother would dawn on evening gown punctuate every sentence of her lecture with the clicks and the clacks of her high heels as she strutted to the door and leave a deep red imprint of her lipstick on my forehead before she allowed herself to be whisked away by her suitor of the night. Those nights are rare when your single mother works 12-hour shifts at the local nursing facility and comes back home to a long evening of drinking, loud television, and heated arguments with her children. This night was better than all the others because the universe had aligned the plans of everyone in the household to coincide, leaving me behind for at least five hours worth of quiet alone time, something I rarely got. I was in my bedroom, my secret stash of snacks scattered all over my bed, and the one shared laptop we had in the house all to myself. I didn't know what I wanted to do first. Watch a movie? Sing along to karaoke songs on YouTube? Have a one-woman dance party? I settled upon watching a scary movie and turned off all the lights to set the mood. I was barely past the 30-minute mark when I heard the distant sound of snickering. For a few seconds, I convinced myself that it was just a background noise in the movie I was watching, but my reassurance faltered when I paused the film and still heard it. I was frozen in place. I didn't know what to do. I just waited for something to happen, but nothing did. I slowly shifted my position. The bed frame creaked under my weight as I did so. I planted both my feet on the ground and paused for a few minutes. It was most probably one of my siblings who had come home early and was playing a prank on me. It could have even been one of my neighbor's kids. Whoever it was, I was a 16-year-old girl who wasn't taking any chances. I finally had the mind to scan the room for anything I could use to defend myself. I shared a room with a 6- and 8-year-old girls. The entire place was childproof, and my best bet was a heavy sports trophy, but I figured that was better than nothing. 
the snickering got louder and nearer. It was turning into chuckles. I didn't know whether I wanted to wait in here until I was found or do the finding myself. I took another long, hard look at the trophy in my hands and decided to wait. With each minute that passed, the laughter increased in volume and enthusiasm. It sounded like a child who knew his parents were heading towards his hiding spot during a game of hide-and-seek, laughing with the voice of an adult. Then, I heard the sounds of chairs being dragged across the hardwood floor. It didn't sound like it was with much purpose other than to clear them out of the way. A slippery, slobbery, wet noise followed suit. It sounded familiar, yet it wasn't one I had particularly heard before. Whoever was in my kitchen was slamming, ripping apart the mushing whatever it was he had in his hands. I heard squishes and squelches, and I could only assume that it was some sick psychopath with a fetish for breaking in the houses and mauling large animals. Whatever it was, he was laughing throughout. I was terrified. There was a stranger in my kitchen, laughing menacingly as he seemingly prepared himself a snack on the counter. There was an intruder in the downstairs of my house, the place where I had left my cell phone. I turned around and looked at my laptop, wondering if the police would respond to emails. I decided to give it a try anyways, and tiptoed back to my bed. My trembling fingers struggled to type slowly and quietly, but I eventually managed to send an email and post for help on social media. An excruciating seven minutes passed by until I heard someone pull up on my driveway. It didn't sound like the police. I heard the sound of heavy footsteps running up to the front door, frantically jamming a key into the keyhole and swinging the door open. The laughter stopped for a brief second before it turned into a roaring scuffle. A shriek and an ear-piercing scream penetrated the silence of the neighborhood and whoever produced it turned around and ran towards the street, taking their screams with them. The manic laughter followed suit and I finally dared to run to the bedroom window. I saw my sister running down the street while screaming, trying to attract as much attention as she could, and by the looks of it, she was succeeding. Running to the opposite direction was a naked man, covered in a massive amount of blood that I had only seen before on television. He was still roaring with laughter as he disappeared out of sight. I watched out of my window as a posse gathered just outside my house. My sister hadn't stopped screaming, I realized that she wasn't just trying to attract attention, but she was actually hysterical and I didn't want to go downstairs and greet whatever had brought my sister to such a state. The crowd grew larger as the flashing red and blue lights arrived and footsteps stormed into my house. I heard curses and wrenches downstairs before someone finally called out. All I could manage to produce at first was a squeak. A female officer appeared in my doorway and asked me if I was alright. She told me to follow her with my eyes closed. Great advice for a rebellious teenager. I noticed her grasp became tighter as we reached the bottom of the stairs and I couldn't help but treating myself to a peek. Through squinted eyes, I saw the dismembered body parts of my mother neatly arranged beside her decapitated head on the kitchen counter. I passed out. 47 minutes. That's how long I spent listening to my mother being torn into, ripped apart, mutilated, and eaten. The person responsible for that ran straight to his nursing facility, straight to his bedroom, and straight into bed. He laughed as they restrained him to his bed. He laughed as he was taken away in cuffs. He laughed as he was locked up in a cell. He laughed as he made eye contact with me in court as his sentence was being announced. I won't be surprised if he was still laughing when they strapped him to the chair. 
he will never laugh again. Nor will my mother. <laughs> when I was 12 years old, we moved to a house on the outskirts of Los Angeles County, not far from Knott's Berry Farm and Disneyland. This was in the early 80s. We lived there for a year, and the house was completely haunted. Here's a list of a bunch of things that happened. First, every night after everyone went to bed, you could hear someone digging with a shovel outside the window, but there was no one ever there. If you turned on your lights, the sound would stop, but only for a few seconds, maybe 30 at the most, and would then resume. If you went outside to check, the sound would be gone and there was no one there. Come back in, and after a few minutes, the digging would continue. Second, I had OCD as a kid and would put all my toys in their place at night. On several occasions, the following mornings, they would be scattered all over the floor as if someone was playing with them during the night. I would yell at my younger siblings, thinking that they had done this. My mother would tell me I was the last one to go to sleep and the first to wake, so it wasn't them. Third, every night, without fail, around 11 p.m., outside the upstairs window, you could hear children yelling, playing in the background. If you looked out the window, it was pitch black and there was nobody there. You could also see all the neighbors' yards, and there was nobody anywhere. One night, I listened carefully to try to make sense of what they were saying or yelling, and I realized they were playing kickball. Kick it! Kick it! Run! Go, 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 go! Yeah! Stuff like this. This happened every night. On more than one occasion, I went downstairs and opened the door to the backyard. The sound was gone. You couldn't hear it from downstairs, only upstairs. Fourth, my grandmother came to spend the night once. She got so scared she never came back. She slept in the upstairs spare bedroom and said she heard noises outside the window. When she looked out the window, down below, she could see a shadow walking up to the front door but no one was there. No one was casting the shadow. Fifth. My aunt spent the night once in the same bedroom, and something similar happened. Noises outside the window. When she looked down below, she saw lights moving and shadows moving towards the front door, but no one was there. Like my grandmother, she struggled to explain what it is that she heard and saw, she never came back to visit. 6. The house rented cheaper than any other house in the area. Every time the landlord would come by to pick up the rent, she would ask if everything was okay. Did we have any problems? It was always odd. My parents would always invite her inside the house, and she would always refuse. 7. The neighbors to the right of us were very strange. They were an older couple. The man would never say a word. Not one. Not even hi. But the wife was always extra nice. She would always ask the same things as the landlord. Is everything okay? Are you guys doing good? She knew something. Eighth. We were playing with one of the neighborhood kids once, running around. We all ran back to our house, and just as we went through the front door, he stopped in his tracks. We said what happened. He said he wasn't allowed in the house. His parents forbid him. Why? Because he had spent the night there once with kids who lived in the house before we did a year earlier. During the night, the mother of the kids who used to live there started screaming and grabbed the kids and ran out of the house. As they ran, 
they all saw a blue mist ghost with a distinct pattern of head and shoulders. Ninth, the only person in my family to see the blue mist ghost was my father, who said it walked down the stairs and directly into a closet. His description was identical to that of my friend who refused to come inside the house. Tenth, the last day we were in the house, we had finished putting things in the U-Haul truck and we were cleaning up the last of things. I remember we were eating pizza too. As we were getting ready to walk out of the house, my father said something like, We're finally getting out of this miserable house, or something similar. Basically, he insulted the house. There was a wall panel three or four feet from the side of him, next to the kitchen. The panel shook and came off the wall and hit him over the head hard. We all saw this. It happened right in front of me. What's interesting about all this is the fact that none of us really talk about it much while we lived in the house. Speaking for myself, I always thought I was imagining things and tried to make sense of what I saw and heard. My younger siblings did the same. For example, the kids playing outside the window. I thought, what the hell are these crazy kids doing playing so late at night? And why every night? I didn't know the answer, but thought there must be an explanation. Being about 12 or 13 years old at the time, I guess I wasn't old enough to figure out that something was very, very wrong. It wasn't until we moved out of the house that we all started comparing stories. And it was always, What? You too? My parents were the only ones that knew that something was wrong, but they didn't want to scare me and my siblings. We were in a bad economic situation at the time, and apparently we could not move out right away. There's a lot more that happened but these are probably the ones that stand out the most. We would always hear doors slamming upstairs and wonder who was up there or did the wind do it. One of us would go check and all the doors would be open. But we all heard a door slam shut. Our cat was a happy-go-lucky animal, but he would all the time freeze at the stairs when least expected, staring intensely and hissing with its fur standing on end. He would always hiss while looking at the top of the stairs. As kids, we would think the cat was crazy. Years later, we realized the cat was actually seeing something, especially since the cat never hissed again in its life once we moved out. Thank you for listening. I guess this is kind of a therapeutic way to get it all out. I used to have nightmares of going back to that house for years after. Luckily, I haven't had any related nightmares in probably 10 years. Now that I said it, I'll probably start having these nightmares again. When I was a kid, I lived deep in the forest in northern Canada. For a few years, we lived in a very big, very old house more than two hours from the nearest town. The house was built right next to an old indigenous graveyard. I'm talking about 20 feet from the front door. I spent many hours playing on the land around our house and sitting at the edge of the graveyard wondering about it, but I never stepped a foot inside. There was a river running by the house that a young girl drowned in many years prior. The house wasn't lived in for a very long time before us, but it was occasionally used by hunters. We were very remote. We didn't have power or running water and the nearest neighbors were miles away. My stepdad was raising cattle and often out in the barn or about a 45-minute drive away at his parents' neighboring ranch. One day, he was in the barn and the door swung shut and locked him in from the outside. He hollered for about 20 minutes, figuring someone had drove up and was messing with him. Suddenly, the door was unlocked and there is nobody there. Nobody driving away. Nothing. 
The first time we heard the chanting was shortly after that incident. My mom and I were inside cooking dinner on the wood stove. It was completely dark outside, so it must have been winter. All of a sudden, clear as day, we hear indigenous chanting coming from outside. Since my mom was still a little spooked by the barn incident, she figured it was my stepdad messing with her and sort of tried to laugh it off. Not even five minutes later, he comes over the radio from his parents' ranch 45 minutes away, saying he was running late for dinner. It happened a number of times, and I remember laying awake in my mom's bed with her just listening. There are no other sounds around us. It is unmistakable. My baby brother moved out of his room into their room as well because his door kept slamming shut without an explanation and stopped once he stopped sleeping in there. There was a lone wolf that wandered our property at night. Never harmed us or our animals, but we seen it in the dark a few times and there were always tracks. I remember dreaming of the same lady over and over again. She had long braids with a dandelion behind her ear, always wearing a red dress. I told my aunt I was seeing her for real, but it was always in the middle of the night, so I'm unsure. I went hysterical one night, crying to my mom because I was scared to die, completely out of the blue. I was a kid. These things happen, but I was always wondered if it was them and they were upset with us. So we moved away. Life moves on. We had a cool story that nobody believes. Then, just under 20 years later, I'm in a new town in a different province. I'm sitting in a recce session for my daughter for the first time and halfway through the therapist looks at me and says that she senses a strong indigenous spirit presence around me. It's such a strong feeling that she has to say something. She could feel that I was accepted by these spirits as a young child and now they are my guardians. So I got my answer. They were never angry. At me, anyways. When I was eight, we moved into a new house in a new state. School was two months away, and with no friends, I spent that summer exploring my new, huge yard that had one very flat section half the size of a football field and the enormous old tree that I was eyeing for climbing. One day early on, I found a pair of dentures in the dirt under the tree. I was eight, so they went in my pocket. That's when the old man, we shall call him Tom, started waving at me. I would see Tom in the yard walking around. He always wore a Hawaiian button-down that was a little faded and outdoor sandals with shorts. He had gray hair glasses and a closed mouth smile that was very friendly. Before anyone says this is weird, this was in a tiny town in the country 25 years ago. Yards were larger but connected mostly without fences. It wasn't unusual to see people walking around, and it felt safe. I saw him for years. Once, when I was 11, I was outside with my dad and saw Tom near one of the barns in the orchard, so I waved. My dad asked me who I was waving at, and so I pointed at Tom and said, Him! I don't have to tell you guys that my dad didn't see anyone, right? That was when I realized something was amiss with Tom. I didn't mention him to anyone again. Until... One day after mowing our elderly neighbor's yard for them, I was invited into their house for the first time. While sipping on lemonade and looking at the pictures they had all over their house, I saw someone familiar. He was younger in the photo, but it was Tom. I know him, I said, pointing and forgetting my personal rule. 
they exchanged an amused look. Yup. Tom used to live in our house. The original owner, best friends with the couple next door and gardener. The huge flat piece of the yard by the huge old tree used to be an enormous garden. He retired and spent his days gardening and napping in a chair under that tree. It was his happy place. One day, he laid back in his chair and fell asleep, never to wake up. Not a bad way to go if you ask me. Tom wore dentures and had lost a set at one point. When I was 14, I tossed the dentures and stopped seeing Tom. But I still think of him often.